Recording in progress. The International Energy Symposium. Uh, I would like to welcome you again uh, after the break. Uh, for our second session, we are going into the nuclear energy uh, and uh, the nuclear energy and utilization uh, with professors Martin Rond from TU Delft and Professor Putra from the National University of Singapore. Uh, Professor Martin Rond will start with his presentation. And uh, yeah, we hope you have a very informative session. Professor Rond, can you? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, can I share my screen? Of course. Okay. It has been a long time ago that I used Zoom. <laughs> so All I of us, I think. <laughs> a bit. Oh, how to share? I will just use no presenter mode. I maximize the screen. Is that okay with you? Yeah, yeah, that can happen as well. Like this? As long as it's, yeah, as I'm long sorry, as I totally forgot how Zoom works. <laughs> okay. Okay, good afternoon. No, good morning here, uh, at least in, uh, in Delft. Uh, mm -hmm. My name is uh, Martin Rode. I work for the Delft University, and uh, one of my main subjects is uh, work on innovative forms of nuclear energy. And one of the things I would like to tell you a little bit about is the energy from uh, from thorium. Well, before I do that, uh, and I have the honor to be the first one uh, in this session, um, I will also tell you a little bit about uh, nuclear energy uh, in general, so how a nuclear uh, uh, reactor works. And so uh, when you look at this picture, you see that, you know, nuclear uh, power is not that, that old. Actually, uh, in 1932, the neutron was discovered, so it's not even 100 years ago. And then <clears throat> a few years later, they discovered uh, a fission. And so uh, you bombard a large uh, nucleus with uh, a free neutron, and then uh, they found new elements that was uh, very new uh, uh, at that time. And they also found uh, a new neutrons, new free neutrons, as you see in the reaction uh, below. And then I think it's just a few months later, they also discovered the chain reaction, because with the new neutrons that you form, you can also um, induce a new fission reaction. So in this way, um, if you can build a machine to sustain this uh, chain rea uh, reaction, you could actually uh, run a nuclear reactor and produce power. Well, that was in 1942. That was the first nuclear uh, reactor. It was part of the Manhattan Project. I, I guess uh, most of you know what that was. Uh, famous uh, scientists were there like Fermi and uh, Einstein, for example, and also Feynman. And uh, this uh, reactor was built in the, um, let, uh, yeah, the uh, uh, a squash center, a squash hall uh, in the middle of uh, the center of Chicago. And uh, this was the first reactor that really run critically, meaning sustainably. So there was, this reactor was able to maintain the chain reactor and produce uh, not much energy, just a little bit of, uh, of energy. 1942, I think it was December 10. And then uh, everything was very positive. Uh, we had in Holland, we, were, uh, we had the atom, het atom. Uh, there was a, a demonstrator reactor built on the airport. As you see here, there's a vessel filled with water with a critical reactor uh, running on uranium. People were just looking at it. And uh, you see that the safety measures by then were a little bit different than uh, nowadays uh, uh, is. And the nice thing to know maybe is that uh, in Delft, we have a nuclear reactor for research and parts of this reactor are uh, still inside our reactor here in, uh, in Delft. That was 1957. Now, how does a reactor work? Really in a nutshell, you have fuel. This is a standard reactor. You have a fuel, uh, uranium oxide. Uh, you pile them up in, uh, in the tubes, as you see here. I hope you see my pointer. And due to the fission product, these uh, tubes become hot. The fuel becomes hot. So you need to cool them. And cooling is done by leading uh, a fluid, mostly water or a gas, along these, uh, these pipes, taking away the heat. And then if you heat something, you can drive or you can create steam. And with the steam, you can drive a turbine and then you create electricity. Actually, that the last part is really conventional, like you do 
in a, also a coal-fired plant or gas-fired plant. So you actually boil water. Now these, these tubes, uh, which are called uh, fuel pins, are stacked together in a fuel element like here. And then the fuel element also contains control rods that you can control the, uh, the energy or the reaction uh, going on. These are then stacked into the reactor core. Uh, there are hundreds of these uh, assemblies or fuel elements stacked in this core. And uh, well, in this way, this is what, a, uh, let's say, a modern nuclear reactor uh, looks like. It's cooled by water and it's uh, run by uranium oxide, uranium. And the main fuel is uranium-235. Uh, 235 is 0.7% of the uranium that you get from the soil, uh, from the ore. Uh, the rest is uranium-238, uh, and mostly for most reactors, you need to enrich it to about 4% to, uh, to get your reactor, let's say, efficient, um, running efficient, uh, efficiently the chain reaction. Now, this is in a nutshell how a reactor, uh, nuclear reactor works. Now, a little bit about the waste. Um, so there is uranium-235. This, this is an isotope table. So on the vertical axis, you have protons. So this is the element, right? Here's thorium. Uh, protactinium, uranium, neptunium, plutonium, and so on. And on the horizontal axis, you have neutrons. So uh, the same element, but different isotopes of the element can be found on the horizontal line. Now, 4% of the, of the fuel is uranium-235 in the beginning, so that's here. And if you fish in them, you, uh, you go to lower elements, uh, somewhere very below in the, uh, in the table, and uh, you win a lot of, uh, of energy. What can also what also is in the reactor, that's the 96%, is uranium-238. And uranium-238 absorbs or captures uh, a neutron and via beta decay, meaning that neutrons are converged to uh, protons, you arrive at a higher element. This is an artificial element. In this case, it's plutonium-239. Um, and plutonium-239 can also be used as a fuel. So this is also a very nice fuel that can be fissioned to smaller fragments going lower in the isotope table. But the plutonium-239 can also capture neutrons. And via beta decay, you arrive at the large here, at the, the upper right corner, and you create long-living elements. And this is why nuclear uh, waste from the current power plants run by uranium contain uh, are uh, for a long time radiotoxic. Now, this is actually a plot about the radiotoxicity. Radiotoxicity is a measure for how dangerous it is for biological systems, uh, radiation. You start in the beginning with the waste, and then you see two curves. You see the red line. This is the radiotoxicity of the fission products. So these are the smaller uh, elements, uh, of, uh, the result from the uh, nuclear reaction. Um, so then you see that, and then, oh yeah, there's another line, the black line, that's a radiotoxicity of uranium from the ground. So that's a kind of base reference uh, state for radiotoxicity. And then the red line drops below the black line about uh, after about 300 years. So the fission products, they do not live for a long time. At least they, are, uh, they lose their radiotoxicity very quickly. Whereas in, um, oh, sorry for the, whereas for the, uh, for the, for the higher actinides, so that, you know, the ones that artificially uh, on the right upper corner in the isotope table, um, these, this is a logarithmic plot. Eh? So this is, a, this is in years, and this is the radiotoxicity. So you see that after 250,000 years, um, the waste, the entire waste, including the actinides, uh, drops below the black uh, line. And this is why radio, active waste, a nuclear waste, is uh, long living, mainly due to the artificial actinides that you produce by neutron capture and, uh, and beta decay. So as an alternative, uh, and this idea is not new, that already existed in, uh, in, the, in the 1960s of the, of the last uh, century, uh, was also proposed to use thorium as a fuel. Now thorium uh, can be found almost everywhere on earth. Uh, if you take a spade of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of sand on average on the earth, uh, this gives you the amount of energy that is uh, the same as what 60 liters of gasoline produces. So there's a lot of thorium. Uh, it's a very stable isotope as well. It has a half-life more or less, uh, which is the same as the, the age of, uh, yeah. of the moon. 
Ik ben bestellen voor het lekker weer hoor. Sorry? Someone said something, but uh, was that a question or? No, I think there was a coincidence. No, I think there was a mistake, yeah. There was a mistake, <laughs> so I'll just continue. Uh, so thorium, thorium can be found everywhere on Earth, so it's politically less uh, you know, sensitive. Um, the only disadvantage of thorium is that itself it's not fissile. So um, you need first to convert the thorium-232, because that's the isotope in, uh, in Earth and in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the universe, to bombard it with a neutron. Then it uh, captures the neutron, producing thorium-233, so a little bit heavier one. And then via beta decay, you produce uranium-233. So, and then the uranium-233, this is a dream fuel because it produces uh, on average more neutrons than uranium-235, but it has a short half life, so you cannot find it in nature. Um, then this uranium-233 um, can be efficient and then you produce the energy. So the, dis the disadvantage of the system is that you need two neutrons to keep the chain reaction uh, going on. Now, now the advantage of using, uh, using thorium, because if you put thorium in the reactor and not uranium-235 and uranium-238, then the highest isotope that you have in the reactor is thorium-232. So you're further away from the higher actinides here. Sorry, this is still Dutch, but... Uh, uh, the higher actinides here, meaning that the thorium-232 can capture neutrons, and at the end also higher actinides are produced, but you're more staying here. So on average in a thorium uh, reactor, um, there are much, much less long-living uh, higher actinides, like the ones for uranium reactors, uh, produced. And what does that mean? Oh, well, that means that for the radiotoxicity, there are hardly any long-living uh, actinides. So we can just scratch out uh, this line, this blue line. And then what we can do is we can reduce. And then so the, the radiotoxicity of the nuclear waste from the thorium reactor is fully determined by the fission products. So then we have 300 years. So we make a huge step from 250,000 years which is very difficult to store and to co also co communicate to the future uh, you know, uh, society, uh, reduced by a factor of 1,000 to about 300 years. So we store something very safely, of course. And uh, well, the rate of toxicity obviously drops exponentially. So in the first you know, tens of years, you lose already a lot of the rate of toxicity. And after 300 years, uh, actually, it's, uh, it's safe. And 300 years is very easily overseeable. I think this is one of the biggest uh, advantages of uh, the thorium uh, reactor. But as I said, um, you have to keep the chain reaction going on. And now you need uh, two neutrons instead of one neutron. And if you have uh, you know, the reactor standard reactor configuration as uh, the one you see here below, was a boiling water-based uh, reactor, then there's too much material that it, uh, absorbs uh, neutrons. And that's not what you want. And a solution is to make the fuel itself also the coolant, so the, 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 the liquid. So actually what you have is a pot of, uh, of uh, liquid salt containing the fuel itself. And then you can, you can obviously see that this, this pot, it's just, of course, a pot of water here, but it's just showing that there's nothing inside except for fuel itself. Whereas here you have fuel and you know, uh, metals and other stuff, and also uh, 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 the coolant itself, the water itself. So this configuration is very good to, uh, to keep the chain reaction uh, sustaining. Now, the, the principle of using a molten salt reactor is not new. I mean, already in the 60s uh, and the 70s, they run a molten salt reactor experiment in the United States. And it runs successfully for a few years. It even ran on uranium-233, showing that it was also capable of running uh, uranium-233, so actually a thorium reactor. Um, and it was just, uh, you know, they stopped. There was no funding anymore. And, uh, well, everyone was continuing with uh, uranium-235. Unfortunately, I would say. But that is, of course, knowledge afterwards. Now, what does the thorium fuel look like? It's a, it's a mixture of lithium fluoride 
uh, which is actually the, uh, the solute. And then we have the uranium tetrafluoride and the thorium tetrafluoride um, dissolved in the lithium-7 uh, fluoride. And this is just a, it's a salt mixture uh, with a temperature of about 750 degrees Celsius in uh, such a reactor. Now, the designs that we work on at TU Delft uh, is the molten salt fast reactor uh, running on, uh, on thorium. It looks a little bit like this. So here, the green thing is the, the vessel. Here, the reaction is going on. The heat exchangers are at the side. So the, what, what actually happens is that the fuel becomes hot and then it's pumped along the heat exchanger and, the, uh, the, uh, ex and in the heat exchanger, the heat is extracted and then you can produce the, uh, the energy, but the salt remains uh, inside. And um, what also happens is that there is a, a treatment area here. Um, that's another advantage of the molten salt reactor because you can online refresh uh, the fuel. You can take out all the elements that you don't uh, want. If you remember the old reactor with uranium oxide, Every year, every one and a half year, you need to open the reactor to refresh uh, the, the, the fuel, which is not necessary here. And another big advantage of this reactor is that it is just one bar. So not 150 bars, like the pressurized water reactor we have here in the Netherlands. 70% is pressurized water reactor in the world. Um, it's just one bar. So there's no net force from the internals of the vessel outward. And then for the students, uh, they all they find very attractive is here for example, is the safety feature, which is the, is the, 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 the it's, a, it's a plug, it's a melting, a melting plug here. The plug is frozen by uh, a liquid, which is uh, cooled, like in your, in your fridge. And now when you have a station blackout, so all the electricity drops, then uh, the plug melts because the plug is also made of this salt. And then the contents of the reactor safely drains into uh, an underground uh, storage uh, tank. So that's another interesting uh, safety feature here. Yeah, there are of course challenges, uh, but I would say uh, um, um, these are challenges that can be overcome. Uh, if you compare to fusion, which is much more, much, much more difficult. Uh, but of course there are still challenges. We're working here in Delft on, uh, on the chemistry. There's a lot of chem very complex chemistry in this, uh, in this type of uh, reactors with actinide chemistry. Um, the materials, that's always a, a thing. Right? You need to withstand uh, high uh, radiation doses. Um, you need to, to yeah, you, you want to have, you know, this reactor for uh, tens of years. Uh, so you have to study uh, this uh, effect, but also corrosion is a thing that needs to be studied. Uh, we, we talk about 750 degrees and hot salt. Um, so we also have a materials lab here at TU Delft. We also have a thermal hydraulics lab where we study the freezing and melting uh, processes, uh, flow, uh, turbulence, uh, heat transfer. And then we also do a lot of modeling because as you know, reactors are paper tigers, as we call. Uh, you can't just simply build a, you know, a demonstrator reactor and then another demonstrator reactor. So you have to model, you have to be sure, you have to be, and then you have a, a paper tiger with, lot, with a high uh, rate of uh, certainty uh, that uh, that reactor will be safe and then it will be built, of course. So modeling is very important, very important. And validation also. Now in the Netherlands, we work uh, together with European partners, uh, but there's also a Dutch initiative, Horizon, which is a, a company. In Europe, they're also uh, to, um, to Danish uh, um, 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 uh, initiatives, Copenhagen Atomics and, and Seaborg. They also work on the thorium reactor. Uh, in the States, there are also three designs that I know of, TerraPower, of Bill Gates, Thorcon, and, uh, and Flype. And very interesting, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's uh, in, in China, that have a lot of funding for uh, new types of reactors. They just finished building the TMSR, which is a, a molten salt reactor. It's based on the design of the American from the from the 60s, with the capability also to put uh, thorium in. It's not a thor a real thorium reactor, but it is a reactor in which you can uh, test uh, different kind of things. So you can also put thorium in and see what happens with uh, with the fuel. A very old design is the Japanese design, but that has been cancelled already in 2011 because of lack of funding. So to, fi to finish my, uh, my talk, this is me in 2037 when I'm retired 
and this is my dream. I really hope that we will have. Uh, I will. I will see such a reactor, uh, of course, to uh, to become true. It is possible, and I think it's. It just depends on how much funding there will be released for this uh, design. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Martin. It was excellent. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, we. Uh, would we love to see your dream come true as well? <laughs> okay, good to hear. <laughs> uh, see, uh, moving talking, by the way. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, no. It's uh, it's true. It's true. But as we, it's a very interesting future that we would like to see as well. The yeah. thing is, um, we will move on now with uh, Professor uh, Nur Azwa Putra. Uh, from uh, the university, from NTU, and uh, we would like to welcome you first off. Hi, uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Hi, thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Rod. Uh, thank you, the organizer, for having me here today. Um, so I'll just start by, I suppose, sharing my slides. Right. Uh, okay, here we go. Can you see it? Yes. All right. Okay, so just a brief introduction. Um, so my name is Aza, and uh, I'm a research fellow at the Energy Studies Institute, which is actually parked at uh, the National University of Singapore. So ESI is a um, policy research think tank. Uh, it's fully funded by the government, and we do a lot of work, uh, a lot of uh, policy research. And we've been around for uh, since 2007, 2008, right? Yeah. Um, so my presentation is, I'm not a nuclear engineer or scientist. Uh, I'm more of a political scientist and I specialize in the geopolitics of uh, nuclear energy, uh, including policy, right? And so my presentation will take you through the, the work that uh, we do at ESI to give you a flavor of the sort of uh, policy governance uh, research. Uh, and then uh, uh, I'll take you through some of the, our activities and the global and regional status uh, of uh, what's going on out there. Plus uh, our take on the prospects for nuclear power. Yeah. So, the work that we do at ESI, uh, we work on the operational assumption that uh, nuclear energy deployment in the region, Southeast Asia, is slightly a matter of when rather than if. Uh, at the back of the nuclear renaissance in the last uh, decade uh, in the region, several uh, member states have uh, expressed interest to deploy uh, nuclear power. And then uh, following Fukushima, right? And then uh, nuclear energy remains in the long-term uh, plans of the ASEAN member states, uh, even though we see that there was a lack of interest uh, in some parts of the world. And then in the recent seven ASEAN energy outlook, energy demand will continue to increase in the future, which then also paves the way for uh, more utilization of, uh, uh, potential utilization of nuclear. Um, and, the ASEAN Energy Outlook anticipates that nuclear could potentially play a role in ASEAN's decarbonization, especially in the power generation sector. And, and it takes into account the work that uh, how the European Union member states also consider nuclear as an important source of low carbon uh, electricity. Now, there are 10 members in the ASEAN region. Five have uh, embarked on provisional nuclear energy uh, infrastructure uh, at different pace. Um, Vietnam was the forefront at one point, but it has since cancelled following Fukushima over uh, safety concerns. Uh, Thailand and Malaysia similarly have uh, slowed down uh, in terms of their infrastructure development, but we see that the Philippines and the Indonesians are moving forward. Um, yeah. In fact, the Philippines have uh, indicated has taken a position that it will and it intends to include uh, nuclear in the long run, right? Uh, the remaining states, Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, have also expressed interest, but they have not done much. Uh, Brunei, similarly. As for Singapore, uh, the decision is that we're still trying to uh, study this uh, nuclear option and see whether it fits into the larger scheme of things, taking into account 
uh, a number of factors. Yeah. Now, so ESI has over the last 12 years situated itself to be in a position where we can offer useful insights and practical re recommendations when called upon. As you know, that nuclear research in Singapore is still at the nascent stage. Uh, yeah. And so we try to position ourselves to be part of a larger discourse on nuclear safety, uh, such as uh, this uh, event. We try to build our credibility and capacity over time. Uh, we participate in international and regional discussions and conversations on nuclear energy and governance. And we contribute towards uh, capacity building at the international level as well. And of course, more uh, it's very important to us that we are able to also engage like-minded people in the academia, industry, international organizations, and the larger policymaking uh, community. Now, the scope of work that we do, uh, this slide here gives you an example of some of the stuff that we have done. We look at the impact of Fukushima on the global nuclear energy governance. We look at the geopolitics of nuclear energy, uh, the sort of bilateral, multilateral cooperation out there. Uh, and we look at the role of epistemic community uh, and the larger policy networks. We look at emergency preparedness and response as well. Uh, we undertake case studies uh, of the nuclear governance framework at the national level in uh, new build and newcomer states. Uh, we also study the regional cooperation and transboundary consultation uh, with other think tanks. Uh, and we also look into nuclear law and liability. Now, what are some of the stuff that we do? We organize conferences as part of our education outreach, uh, seminars, roundtables, workshops, training courses. We engage in capacity building, uh, network building, uh, and it's not enough to just engage those uh, within our comfort zone or those within reach, but we also try to create a presence at the international level uh, by participating in events organized by the International Atomic Energy Agency and the World Nuclear University. And of course, being a uh, research level institute, we publish academic articles, books, policy briefs, and uh, opinion pieces. Now, the basis of the work that we do, right? When we look at the reactors uh, in operation uh, at the international level, we see that um, nuclear is still highly uh, popular. Uh, of course, the US, France, and China are leading the race in terms of deployment. We look at the reactors under construction, uh, China, India, and Turkey uh, are also uh, among the forefront. Of course, China is leading by a huge margin. And then when you look at the reactors under construction, looking ahead, right, you can see that in terms of the region, uh, the, in terms of the Far East Asia, uh, that's where the bulk of the number of new reactors will be developed, uh, construct, followed by Europe, Middle East, and yeah, and the rest. Okay, so zooming in, um, in terms of the global and regional status, right, there are 410 nuclear power reactors in operation. 57 are new, and amongst the new, uh, sorry, um, yeah. And so these are largely in uh, the scope of the large conventional reactors. Uh, we believe, or it appears at least, that small modular reactors are born for the future. And what is it that these SMRs are different from the conventional reactors? Uh, well, SMRs have a small uh, generation capacity, up to 300 megawatt which is typically a third of the generating capacity of traditional nuclear power reactors. Physically, it's a fraction of the size of the traditional plant uh, reactors, and they are modular systems and components are factory assembled and can be transported as a unit to the, uh, to the site. And uh, it uses advanced nuclear reactors that uh, harness nuclear fission uh, as well. Now, some of the examples of these small modular reactors, which uh, many have started as a game changer, right? Basically, there are about uh, there are 50 to 80 commercial designs in 19 countries which are being developed globally. Uh, react these SMRs take lesser time, fewer resources to develop, and lower upfront capital costs. And also, it has enhanced safety features. Now, it's scalable, which makes it attractive because uh, there's a potential to increase capacity over time. Uh, there are not, there are no commercial scale deployment yet, 
uh, we see uh, other than uh, the ones that are currently being constructed in Argentina, China, and Russia, there are no SMRs in operation. Now, because of that, there's still much that we do not know of SMRs, right? Uh, and this poses some issues from a governance uh, point of view. Uh, issues such as uh, how do you harmonize regulatory and safety standards, especially when you consider that there are many designs out there. Uh, current thinking and strategies on nuclear waste management and decommissioning strategies need to be adapted, taking into context of SMRs. And the current thinking of EPR, safety zones, so on and so forth, need to be adapted as well, right? Yeah. And so given all this, what are the prospects of nuclear power? So one could take the position that nuclear will continue to play an important role, given the dec decarbonization of, uh, it could decarbonize the power systems in the context of global decarbonization efforts and net zero aspirations. It can contribute to the use of low carbon technologies, especially for instance, in the production of hydrogen. It is likely given the current uh, trajectory that there will be more new builds and newcomers uh, in the future. Uh, the new and emerging nuclear technologies reactors may be deployed in the region by 2050, if not sooner. And amongst the ASEAN member states, uh, likely front runners are the Philippines and, uh, and Indonesia. And they are, uh, as a matter of fact, looking into the potential of deploying SMRs. So essentially, I think the position is that SMRs can and it may potentially be a, a game changer. Yeah. So that's it. Thank you very much. Looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Putra. It was uh, uh, really enlightening to see some of these advances. Uh, moving onwards to the questions, uh, we have some questions that they typed uh, that we typed in the chat, which is for both uh, professors if they could answer some of them. Uh, the first one is uh, by Lin Jia Yi. Uh, why is thorium tetrafluoride used uh, as the fuel and not as pure thorium? It was for Professor Martin. Yeah, the, <laughs> yeah. Um, because um, you need to create a, a salt. A thorium uh, itself uh, has a, a, a very high uh, melting temperature, uh, but you want to have a, you know, a, a fuel a salt or a liquid, let's say, based on thorium that has a temperature of, uh, you know, between 600 and 750 degrees Celsius. So you need to create a, a salt uh, that has a, a certain yeah a temperature, a melting temperature. So then what you do is you uh, mix. Um, you cannot simply use uh, you know thorium and put that in uh, in lithium fluoride, for example, because then it will immediately react uh, with uh, with the lithium fluoride. So, um, but as a, as a stable combination, uh, thorium tetrafluoride. Um, uh, and uh, uranium uh, fluoride and lithium fluoride is a, is a stable combination as a salt in the in the, in the reactor. And by the way, for the fission product, for the fission itself, it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, what what matters is that there is a thorium nuclei in the in the salt. Okay. Okay. I hope this answers the question. If there's a follow up. Uh, at this point, is um, this is addressed to both professors to what are some of the major obstacles for nuclear energy to become commonplace or commercialized? Well, I, if I may start, uh, uh, that is a very difficult question <laughs> because um, uh, there's that's much more than technology. Uh, it is also uh, it also depends on where you have. Uh, if you look at China. Uh, then, um, you know, the government supports nuclear energy. If you look at Germany, on the other hand, uh, they are against uh, nuclear energy. So that's one thing that makes a, a big, a big difference. Um, a second thing, of course, is uh, acceptance. Uh, politically, uh, so in the Netherlands, for example, uh, we have, uh, you know, we are now positive uh, 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 with respect to nuclear power. But then you have a lot of, you know, uh, the people, uh, what is it, uh, uh, Inspark, um, um, 
it's 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 it, it, it's it's very hard, let's say, to convince certain communities to put the reactor, especially there. So it's it's uh, even then, and the licensing also is very uh, it's a very long process. So building does not take that much time. It's more the license is also licensing takes a lot of time. And then mm. third is that uh, also you know um, there's a lack of producers of uh, power stations uh, because of the, the the situation of the, the last decades. Uh, the number of producers of nuclear power plants is not that large. So if you want to have a nuclear power plant, you cannot yeah. get it tomorrow. You have to wait because there are others also want to have a power plant. So that also that is is a problem. So also that infrastructure needs to be developed. I see. Yeah. I mean, I really agree. And I probably will add a rejoinder that, uh, and I will just raise two points here. First is that public acceptance is absolutely critical, right? And public acceptance uh, is not easy, uh, especially for, uh, we have seen in the past how public uh, opposition, public uh, gets in the way of constructive discussion, discourse, and even implementation of civilian nuclear power programs, right? And public acceptance has a lot to do with public education as well. And every time uh, a nuclear has suffered from uh, bad reputation right mm -hmm. yeah three uh, major accidents in the past um, and some countries still couldn't shake off so yeah public acceptance is really important in fact it's crucial yeah. and the other issue is i mean again this has somewhat something to do with public acceptance is the issue of uh, waste management right uh if you look at in the case of the us uh not being able to resolve the long-term management or disposal of waste uh, is a big impediment for the industry to move forward. It's a big impediment for the country and the government to move forward because you need to answer these questions up front. You need a resolution. You need uh, solutions. There are solutions in place, but then again, these solutions may not be able to be implemented, implemented because of public acceptance. Yeah. So I until see. you resolve one issue, you may not be able to continue move forward with the others, right? Which then again raises the prospects of SMRs, why SMRs are uh, enticing because it somewhat uh, resolves the issue of uh, waste. But then again, at this point, it's still uh, there's still a lot that we do not know. I see. Is it is it a more issue of uh, only public acceptance or only or public information as well to have like a knowledge of what uh, nuclear energy is? Oh, that's absolutely true. I mean, public acceptance has a lot to do with knowledge and information and public education as well, right? And the develop and the role of the epistemic community, role of uh, thinkers, academics, and scientists uh, engaging the wider public uh, mm. in terms of uh, education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, I see. Uh, another question is, what do you think about modular nuclear power plants? How scalable are they? What size can they range and can they accommodate? Uh, what are the main safety considerations for deploying such things offshore in offshore environments? It's three questions, essentially. I think it's, uh, can answer that because you are on the small modular reactors. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, like I said, I'm not a, I'm a political scientist, so I try my best to answer this, right? Um, I think, first of all, let me see, SMRs, right? The question is on SMRs. Mm -hmm. SMRs are new, uh, mm -hmm. no precedent. Uh, there's a lot of advanced designs out there that are still being considered. There are a lot of things that we still do not know. And it's really hard to come to a, uh, to uh, a, a, a to a position where one can provide uh, some insights into it, right? Without speculating too much, yeah. So in terms of scalability, that's part of the design. That's part of the attractiveness of it. And I understand that from the literature that scalability could go, uh, it really depends on the, the reactor design itself. Yeah. So to what extent will, it depends on the, uh, on the design and the technology, I am not, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I don't have a good understanding on this yet, but conceptually, the idea is that, yeah, it could be scalable. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah, I think that's the attractiveness of uh, SMRs. Yeah? So <clears throat> also, uh, I think there's also uh, the, the large scale uh, plans are not very in favor. Uh, if you look at the EPR in Finland, how long that takes to, uh, to build. And uh, so it, it, that's part of the popularity, but it also has some safety, uh, additional safety features. Uh, first of all, and the most important one is that, of course, uh, there's much less uh, fuel per reactor vessel. So if something happens, uh, you have a smaller scale uh, accident, uh, if the accident is there. And another thing is that uh, uh, what you saw, in, for, for example, in Fukushima was not a nuclear accident. Fukushima was actually a thermohydraulic accident uh, because they were not able to cool uh, the reactor contents. Uh, hey, if you stop the reactor, there's still uh, um, a decaying products. So there's still what they call, uh, let's say, waste heat uh, produced, which is in the beginning 6% of the power of the reactor, and you need to cool it. And if there's nothing to cool, if there's no pumps, there's no water uh, to cool, it's, it's very difficult to, to get the heat uh, out. And if you have smaller reactors, smaller reactors are, are much more favorable, let's say, surface to volume ratio. There's more surface to cool with respect to the volume, so the, the size of the reactor, meaning that it is easier in uh, when there is an accident to cool such, uh, such a thing. So that's another important uh, safety feature. And um, there's more, let's say, a technical reason maybe. Mm. <clears throat> I see. Is it, uh, can it accommodate to have the question that they, and how safe are they offshore? Ooh, um, how safe are they offshore? Um, I'm not an expert in, uh, in, 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 in that, actually. Um, yeah. We have reactors offshore, which uh, are in, 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 uh, in uh, submarines, uh, but these are pressurized water reactors, of course. Um, I'm not an expert. I know uh, that uh, with re when you run a reactor on sea, you have to take care that, uh, you know, you have, of course, the waves that uh, uh, play a role in the reactor physics uh, thing. Um, um, I know that uh, what what I know is that they are interest that that especially the uh, the offshore industry is very interested um, 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 uh, because uh, for example these uh, these these uh, these large facilities to uh, to 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 obtain oil from uh, uh, from from the sea um, they use a lot of uh, of, of uh, fuel so if you can replace it by a very small uh, let's say yeah container. Uh, you know, a sea, a sea container size uh, uh, reactor, uh, which can run for 10 years without, you know, doing anything about it. It just runs for 10 years. Uh, that's very attractive. And that's also for ships, large ships. I see. Uh, very attractive. Yeah. Hmm. But in terms of safety, I'm not an expert. I cannot tell anything about that. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 I think the question is uh, sufficiently answered in that regard. Uh, my uh, another question is: Do you agree that the knowledge is somewhat lost or outdated about commercially implementing the nuclear plants projects? Uh, because the world is moving away from uh, nuclear energy for quite some time. Yeah, that's what. Uh, yeah. So, well, if if I if I just speak uh, um, uh, in terms of the Netherlands, for example, mm -hmm. uh, then our knowledge infrastructure is very low currently. There's one. A uh, research group that I'm part of in the Netherlands working on uh, nuclear power. Uh, and uh, fortunately, now the Ministry of Economic Affairs, they invest on yearly basis millions of euros uh, to invest in, uh, in, in, in knowledge because you need people to run a facility to build a nuclear power station. Uh, but we are, <laughs> we come from far, let's say. We're now, uh, we need a lot of new people. And, and also a, a larger knowledge infrastructure, yes. And I think that also holds uh, worldwide in, in, in other countries and continents. Uh, Dr. Put, do you have anything to say on that, maybe? Yeah, I mean, we observe that uh, there is uh, an issue of age gap, right, within the labor force, uh, yeah, but, which is why knowledge management is uh, is really important. And knowledge management at the international, at the national levels, uh, 
useful uh, and uh, should be structured in a way that it ensures that uh, critical information uh, does not get lost over time, right? Yeah, but I'm also aware that there's a lot of cooperation uh, at the international level to ensure that uh, knowledge on nuclear is uh, somewhat uh, institutionalized. Um, yeah, so maybe there's some truth to it. I'm not entirely certain there's a lot of truth to that, but yeah. I wouldn't disagree too much. Yeah. Can I add to the, the, your last remark, uh, Professor Putra? Because um, I think that you, you talk about international cooperation. Um, I think there's also a lack of international cooperation. Um, if you look, uh, if you consider the, the continents. So it's very hard to cooperate with, uh, with the American. It's very hard to work together with, uh, with the Chinese. And all the, the cooperation there is, is quite, let's say, superficial. Uh, it's also sensitive information, of course. But what I really would love to see, if I talk about the thorium reactor, for example, is that there's a kind of ITER, you know, ITER is the fusion reactor, which is a worldwide international project. I would really like to see that also for the molten salt reactor, for the, the thorium reactor, for example, but also other designs. Because these things are, cost so much money, it's so large, it's so complex that, um, I think we better join forces in that sense. And as, so I see in Europe, there's a lot of cooperation, I think also in the States, but between the continents, I would love to see more cooperation. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. And I think uh, cooperations can be pursued either at uh, international, national, through bilateral, through multilateral, right? So institutionalizing yeah. cooperation is one way to do it. Uh, and of course, I think it's really important also to place the IAEA uh, at the center of cooperation, right? So that yeah. one feels that one is part of a larger international community. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And I think that's what we, uh, the ASEAN member states are also trying to do. You know? We are uh, trying to bring everyone together to a common platform to come to a common understanding. And sometimes it makes more sense to, to, to find, to seek assistance as a group rather than to engage individually. Yeah. 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 That would be a project uh, for the future generations to take on, I guess. Yes, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, let, let's see that we made, uh, we made a big, big, big step. And that, I mean, the reason was really wrong because there was a war. But you, thanks to the Manhattan Project, I mean, that project was meant to build a nuclear bomb. So the reason was not, not nice, but... You see that uh, by then there was spent so much uh, funding that the knowledge that was created there for nuclear energy that we have right now, yeah, we made a big step uh, by then. Of course, we don't want to have war here. Huh? So, uh, but you see that one, this big project, the Manhattan Project itself, uh, accelerated the, uh, the developments. And I think that we need to join forces, put a lot of funding, billions of euros in it, and then we can make a fist. Huh? We can really come to something. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it, it's uh, the, the stakeholders have to be involved, right? It just cannot simply be a G2G. Stakeholders must be involved at the industry level, universities, think tanks, you all work together to a common platform, yeah. yeah. All right, let's move on to the next question, even though this is a very interesting topic. Uh, this is for Dr. Putra uh, specifically. You mentioned that the ESI conducts research conducts research on nuclear power. Uh, are they conducted in Singapore? Uh, are there any active nuclear reactors in Singapore, SMRs or otherwise? Okay, so there are no nuclear reactors in Singapore. There are react nuclear research reactors uh, in Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam. And I think Philippines as well, yeah. But there are no reactors in Singapore, research or, or commercial. Um, yes, we conduct research on nuclear power, but uh, we are one of the three institutions uh, that conduct research, uh, at least within NUS. Uh, our emphasis on, is on policy, uh, policy and good governance. Uh, and then we have the Center for International Law. It looks at the legal and regulatory frameworks that includes liability. And then, of course, we have uh, SNASI, Singapore Nuclear Safety Research Institute. Now, those guys over there, they are, that's where you find the engineers and the nuclear scientists. They do a bit more technical research. Yeah, 
But as of now, the simplest answer is no, they are non-nuclear reactors. Mm -hmm. And of course, we, we have another institution at NTU, within NTU, Rajaratnam School of International Studies. There's a team there under Professor Meli Caballero and uh, Anthony. Mm -hmm. uh, they look at nuclear security and safeguards. Yeah. So I would say by and large, these are the four institutions. Yeah. Mm, I see. Right. Uh, this is a second question for you, uh, Professor. Is uh, CO2 migration mitigation uh, CO two mitigation is uh, the need of the hour. Uh, how do you assess Germany moving away from nuclear uh, while still using fossil fuels for its energy needs, especially given the CBD and RC principle? Yeah, I'm not clear what the CBD and RC principles are, but I think the the general answer is that. Uh, you know, I, I, I had an interesting conversation with Lady Barbara Judge. She used to lead, uh, she's pretty prominent uh, in the nuclear uh, field. And she used to say all the time, you know, nuclear is three Ps. Politics, politics, politics. Yeah. And we see that. Uh, um, so, yes, in view of CO2 mitigation, um, there is a general acceptance and recognition nuclear has to play a part. Uh, in decarbonizing the power systems, right? Uh, to what extent? I think the general principle is that maybe not more than twenty percent of uh, of the entirety uh, of the entire global effort, right? But we can debate that. But the point being is there is a consensus. Consensus: nuclear should play a part. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in regard to Germany, right? Uh, the basis of Germany's uh, decision has to do with the green politics, right? Uh, and that decision was made before the Russian-Ukrainian uh, war. Now, but a decision has been made. It's hard to reverse, especially after you have uh, decommissioned uh, most of your uh, nuclear power plants, right? But even then, it realized that at some point, it needed nuclear, and it delayed the decommissioning of the last uh, plant. Uh, mm -hmm. So, if you ask me, my opinion is that uh, it has made this decision. It's very hard to reverse. Nothing much can be done right now. So, it has to find other sources of energy, clean energy. Uh, but then again, it raises the question, right? When you make a political decision on the issue of nuclear based on uh, certain uh, green politics, uh, it's it can be less than uh, desirable in the global scheme of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, on that, as a follow-up, uh, I think this is addressed to both. Uh, do you think there needs to be more policy and planning for nuclear at, global, at a global scale, especially as a part of working group three proceedings of IPCC? I am under the impression that there's already a coordinated policy and planning at the global scale. Uh, mm -hmm. At the institutional level, especially, you know, if you look at within the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, and uh, there are supporting institutions as well, as, such as the World Nuclear Association, there are many actors out there who are trying to bring everyone together in terms of uh, coordinating the policy and the planning. But policy and planning is not as simple as just bringing everyone together, right? Because you need to have competency. You need to have the right people in place. You need to have the right institutions supporting the government. Yeah. And yeah, so while I, I suppose the simple answer is yes, greater coordination is always good, but over coordination may not be. Uh, at the end of the day, it's still a sovereign decision. Yeah. I but see. I think enough is being done, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe the issue becomes, are we seeing the same pattern at the regional level, at the, within the different continents? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a matter, it's more of a matter of uh, whether this coordination is happening at the same time everywhere. Yeah, at the regional, at the sub-regional levels. The... Mm -hmm. yeah. I do not, okay, I see. Uh, let's move on. Uh, there are other others 
other than, than pursuing studies in nuclear sciences, what else can students do further? To fu what else can students do further? To I'm sorry, <laughs> I read the question wrong. Uh, what else can students do to further the nuclear energy space? Meaning, what extra yeah. research can so happen? I think, I think that what the what Satvik means is uh, you can further uh, nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. Not specific space, I guess. Yes, that's what I. That's that's. I thought. <laughs> how... I think. Yeah. So, so the, the most important thing is uh, pursuing the study, of course, and then mm -hmm. start working in that field. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. at the same time, uh, also um, just uh, 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 inform the world. Um, and if you're an academic, uh, you should do it on an academic level. So just objective, just tell the objective uh, a story. Um, and uh, there's a lot of emotion um, in, in nuclear power, but just uh, tell uh, about nuclear energy as it is. What is it? Uh, so inform them. Um, but the first thing is most important thing, just to study it and you start working in it. Uh, that's the most important thing, most important contribution, right. for sure. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm also thinking that he meant what fields are there to expand upon, meaning some cutting edges, perhaps uh, technologies or space. I I would add nuclear law. You know, uh, mm. oh. yeah, I would add that. I, I agree with Professor Roth uh, entirely, and I would add nuclear law because. Mm -hmm. You do need lawyers, uh, and not just those who engage in contracts or on the commercial side of it, but also lawyers who could scrutinize uh, good governance, good practices, so on and so forth. Yeah. Hmm. And it also helps that uh, nuclear lawyers make a lot of money, I suppose. <laughs> yes, because there is the the biggest uh, difficulty in nuclear energy is <laughs> the <Yeah>. policy <laughs> point. <laughs> I, think ah. earn, I think they earn more than nuclear engineers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've come to understand, maybe I'm wrong, but 80% uh, of uh, constructing a nuclear power plant is all um, uh, based on legal fees. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, yes, indeed, I think nuclear law is one of the. <laughs> yeah. It's to combat all the, all the laws, essentially, <laughs> that prohibit, that make it prohibitive. Yeah. Um, do you think uh, the expected funding for thorium reactors in the coming years should be enough to realize such a design? No, <clears throat> that's a big no, I would say. <laughs> um, well, it depends on where you are. If you're in China, you would say yes. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you're in Europe uh, and also the United States, you would say no. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, if you look at uh, funding from the European Commission, they pay for the European design, which is the molten salt fast reactor. Then you talk about millions. Uh, let's say a project every two years of 10 million euros. I would say just add three zeros. Then you make a difference. And oh, I see. This, these are just, and you, you also have some scattered companies that invest uh, in this, uh, in this uh, technology. But at the end, I mean, designing a new reactor uh, just consumes uh, a lot of investment. So, uh, and the, the, at, at this moment, I, I guess we missed two or three zeros. Oh, I see. Uh, just uh, mainly Alex, for example, they spent 11 billion euros for uh, biomass. I think it's a waste of money, but uh, 11 billion. So it was easily paid for biomass. So. If you would invest that money only as a Netherlands, there's money enough here uh, for this type of reactor. We would, uh, that would be sufficient to uh, to develop such a reactor. I see. So is it is it more of a um, the, the main issue is the design issue? The, the main issue is the development, uh, finding the proper materials uh, and so on. So it's the it's the that that well that's the biggest step, of course. You need to <clears throat> to to come with a design uh, that at the end uh, uh, will be licensed. Mm -hmm. And oh, uh, that costs a lot of money, of course. I see. And so, uh, 
for each reactor, this is the same. It's the same story, of course. Yeah. And this type of reactor is really new. <clears throat> so, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So it's limited. That's the answer. Too limited. It's too limited to take part in such a thing. Okay, and I see. And, and also, it's, it's left too much to the uh, commercial partners. So uh, I, I think also the government should should spend uh, money uh, to this idea to help to this kind of, to this kind of it. yeah to start this economy to start you know uh, the initiatives uh, at the companies. Perfect. Well, I think you answered all the questions uh, that are <laughs> that were uh, thrown <laughs> at you, I guess uh thank you so much both for your presentations it was uh exceptionally interesting uh 